what I'd like to do is give you a flavor of what our thinking is at the World Bank, uh, where, we are, where we see the trajectory globally in a number of areas <laughs> of what are the global trends around food and agriculture, how does it link with climate change, what's the role of trade in this, what's the role of the interaction between the public sector and the private sector, because I think these are some of the most defining themes of our time. And then, of course, the broader issue around sustainability that all of us love to talk about, but I think only part of us are convinced that we are even close to that, to real sustainability in agriculture. And I think we are going to be faced with a challenge in this decade to try to, do, to get real about it. And I think we at the bank are taking this very seriously. So does Ireland. We had wonderful conversations with the Department of Agriculture this morning. A number of other actors last night. He, he, he failed to mention that I also had a dinner until 11 last night. And so, <laughs> so there was very little sleep in the last 24 hours. But I'm truly inspired and I'm excited by what I've seen so far in Ireland. The reason I came is because your country, even though it is not a very large country, is emerging as a leader on the global question of what does it mean to produce your food sustainably. And this will be a question that every country around the world in this decade will have to answer in one way or another. And we'll have to put in place the policy frameworks, the incentive structures, the mechanism by which private sector operate, the license to operate, the interaction between public and private. Everyone will have to deal with this. Because we're going to, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where the consumers will want food that is produced on a sustainable basis. It's not happening everywhere yet. It's not fully there yet, but it's happening very rapidly. We, will, we are in, going to be in a situation where every private company on this planet will have to ask itself, how do I source my raw material? Is that really sustainable what I do? Do I actually have an idea what I'm doing globally? in terms of the water footprint, in terms of the broader environmental footprint, in terms of the biodiversity footprint, in terms of the social footprint. Is child labor involved in what I'm doing? All these questions that are bubbling up and are out there and have not really translated into action everywhere are going to come to us. And why do I say that? Why do I not think that business as usual will prevail? It's simply because we can't afford to and because we're running out of time in the agriculture and food security space. We will have to feed three billion more people on this planet, as you will very well know. None of these three billion people will be born in food secure environments. They will all be born in areas that are currently not very food secure. They will not be born in Europe or in America or in Australia or in Japan. They'll be born in, in the developing world or in the middle income countries. So we will have to produce food in a different way and we will also have to have a trading system which currently is not functioning very well globally, that allows them to get that food uh, at, at a reasonable cost. And I'm not you know, advocating free trade blanket here. I'm advocating for a process that allows those who need the food to get it when they need it. So these are sort of the, the two big, big strands. Um, one thing that is becoming increasingly clear, and Ireland is leading the way on, on this, is that agriculture and the way we produce our food, and more broadly, the way we manage our landscapes globally, are the single largest co contributor to climate change. It's bigger than transport. The emissions from food production globally are more significant than the car emissions that you have out on the street. And it's kind of known, because we, many of you have seen the IPCC report, the Panel on Climate Change report, but it is not in the public consciousness that we need to do something about it. And it's only beginning now to take, get traction. And we haven't been caught as an agricultural practice and as an ag agricultural community, but we will be. Because as these negotiations proceed, there will be the question, and, and what are you going to do over the next 30 years to reduce your emissions? And Ireland's in the middle of this conversation, as I was uh, told in the last 24 hours, and it's a very important conversation to have. The energy sector has been innovating for 25 years. We have now windmills, I saw them yesterday, you have them, they're all over the world. We have solar panels. We have technology that used to be esoteric and, and blue sky 25, 30 years ago and way too expensive for anything to be taken seriously, now I'm fully mainstream, took 25 to 30 years. In the car industry, it's the same. We now have electric cars, we have hybrid cars, we have the technology, not only in theory, but in practice among us, 
that can take us to a different path. What do we have in agriculture? Do we have an electric car in agriculture? Anyone? Solar panel? Completely energy independent, game changer, completely different technology, do we have that? We don't. Do we need it? I think we do. I really think we do. We need to look at two ways of how we change the way we produce our food and manage our landscape to reduce our footprint globally. One is incremental change, and, and this is where Ireland comes in with an incredible effort already to begin to measure what you're doing, systematically addressing it one by one, every step of the value chain on the production side, everything, and reducing it. But at the same time, we also need to take it a step further and begin to think about how we feed our animals in the future, how we feed the planet in the future. And I just want to give you one glimpse of what I would call the electric car in agriculture, which is being developed in the US at the moment in Hawaii, and that is algae production in plastic tubes using basically no land area, can be done in the desert, no footprint on land, using no water except for brackish water, which has no, no freshwater footprint, no carbon emissions, putting algae in a plastic tank with brackish water, exposing it to the sun. Biomass production is 100 times more than anything that can be produced on one hectare of land in any agricultural system. If we just could develop that over the next 10 years, and I don't want to dwell in, in sort of blue sky technology too long, but just to give you an idea what, what, what we're talking about. If that could be developed in the next 10 years and you would feed a third of the world's animals with that rather than soya beans or corn produced at huge amount, huge cost, and huge global footprint, you could reduce the footprint by a third globally. Massive stuff. It's about 10 times more expensive today than conventional feed. When they started, the solar technology was 35 times more expensive. Now it's competitive. It took them 25 years to get from 1975 to today. Given today's technology and knowledge that we have, it wouldn't maybe even take 10 years, 15 years to get to that. It, they've invested a billion in it. I think the current investment in renewables is in the order of, I, I don't want to get the number wrong, but it's, a, it's in the three-digit billions per year, three, 350 or something like that, 250 a year, right? So if we apply the same principle in agriculture, we can change the game. Are we doing it? No, not really, and not in any significant way. So one of my first messages is we need to invest in agriculture research. Because we don't have the research capacity, nor do we have the vision, nor do we have the package that will lead us to the next generation of the way we feed this planet. It's happening in corners, in, in, in piecemeal fashion, but our agricultural research approach right now is still the way we've always done it. We breed higher yields. We breed a vitamin in, into it over the last 20 years here and there because we want nutritional outcomes, which are very important. We breed adaptation breeds, uh, uh, traits in, into what we do. We have flood tolerance genes now bred in. We have heat tolerance, which is hugely important. We've got uh, drought uh, tolerance. We've got pest and disease resistance into it. So we are incrementally improving things. And we are good at the adaptation and the productivity side, but we are not looking at, and at the same time, does this crop, this new variety, or this system in, within, in, in which it's grown actually reduce our footprint? And it's not just carbon, it's, it's methane, obviously, in the livestock sector, and it's nitrous oxides. So you take those three things. Our current thinking in agricultural research does not have a multiple objective function. And we're adding it on rather than making it a mainstream thought. And this is why we are discussing increasingly this concept of what we call climate-smart agriculture. And I want to talk a little bit about that because there is some confusion you know, around various corners. Hey, what does this have to do with GMOs, or is there something about you know, the carbon trade or is this something else, right? This is not at all any of this. What it basically means is, in summary, what I've just described to you over the next 10 minutes, going forward, the way we produce our food, we need to be highly productive. Let's be very clear. That is the key thing we need to do because we need to increase our production. It is not like even transport or some of the other things where we may or may not have, have a growth trajectory. We know we will have 9 billion people. We know we need to produce a lot more food. But we also know that we need to be more resilient and we need to have adaptation traits that allow the farmers who produce that food to deal with climate change and other shocks. So that's the second part. The first part is high productivity of climate smart agriculture. The second part is high resilience and adaptation. And they come in that order. 
And then thirdly, you want a system that at the same time is not causing a huge amount of trouble and, and, and causing a huge footprint. You want something that in addition gives you a co-benefit, which is a much lower footprint. And, which is very important, unlike all other sectors, including transport and energy, which can't do that, agriculture can reabsorb carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. No other sector can do that. A solar panel doesn't take a single carbon a molecule out of the atmosphere. It just lowers your emissions, but it doesn't reverse anything. If we manage our landscapes well, including forestry, of course, and that there it's obvious, but the broader agricultural system, we can, in theory, reabsorb up to 80% of all emissions that we have in the atmosphere today. That's what the scientists tell us. If we had all the degraded lands on this planet under proper management, and it's 2 billion hectares, it's a huge area. If we had those under proper management with high productivity, high resilience, and a system that reabsorbs carbon out of the atmosphere, we would not only be not part of the problem, we would be part of the solution. That's why it's doubly important to invest into this. It's partly because we are a big part of the problem and we need to reduce that, but it's also because there is potential opportunity out there that is nowhere else. All right, so this is the concept of climate smart agriculture. Is it about trade-offs? In some places it is. Not every place you will get the three easily, but in many places it's not. There are many systems around the world where you can see a, a crop production or animal or livestock or, or mixed combined system that gives you all three. Highly productive, highly resilient, and a low footprint. And it's up to us and the scientists of this world and as, as, as an international community to find those, describe those, fund those, and scale them up as fast as we can. That gives you, in a, in a nutshell, a flavor of what we're going to do at the World Bank. We will be very deliberate and systematic over the next few years in our portfolio and pipeline going forward to ask those kind of questions. We will not just go out and have another livestock project or another you know, rice improvement project just for the sake of improving the productivity. Everything we'll do, we will have to ask the question, and what do we do with resilience in this system? And what does this do to the footprint. So if it's a rice production system, you want to have less methane emissions. And you can have less methane emissions and less nitrous oxide emissions if you manage your water better, reduce the, amount, the number of days under, under flooding. Every day, less flooding in a rice field reduces your methane emissions significantly. It's never been done before because nobody cared. It's convenient to have them flooded for the whole period. Water is there and who cares, right? It, it's good for yield. We know today that you can reduce the number of days underwater significantly without compromising yield. Just give you one example. Deplacement of fertilizer. You throw the fertilizer into the field. If you're lucky, it, it works. If you don't, it gets washed out in, up, up in the air or, or down into the groundwater. 60% of all urea today applied in the developing world disappears in the environment, leading to 800 plus dead zones in the oceans around the world, combined the size of Texas. 800 areas in the oceans on the coastal areas around the world are dead. There's no life. No fish, no nothing, no shrimp, no mollusks. It's dead because it's over-eutrified and they are growing and expanding. Can we talk about sustainable agriculture? And it's not only agriculture, but agriculture is a huge contributor to that, to that global runoff. It's not a system that can continue, right? So the fertilizer is the next piece. <clears throat> First is the water management, then the fertilizer. If you deep place your um, fertilizer rather than spread it on, on the ground, you can reduce up to 30% your runoff and, and, and your emissions out of that. Basic stuff. It's been done on a million hectares in Bangladesh and in India already. Should it be done everywhere? Absolutely. Right, so I just want to give you a flavor and examples that this is not academic or a concept, that there is stuff out there that has to be had and there's an urgency that we get into it. This is the stuff we know. We have uh, agroforestry systems in Africa. We briefly touched on that earlier this morning, where you have the sweet spot right there in front of you. Corn production in Niger, very low yield. You plant Phyderbia albida, which is a legume tree, a nitrogen-fixing tree into that system. That increases the nitrogen content in the soil. You double your, your, your yield for corn. You take carbon out of the atmosphere, sequester it, because you have a much higher biomass in the system, and you build resilience. So you have all these three things together. No trade-off. It's a win-win-win. You know, do I sound overly optimistic or on a sales journey here? <laughs> I don't want to do that, right? There's not everywhere, and it doesn't happen every, every time. But there is stuff out there that we know and that we're not taking and putting it to scale. 
And we need to change that rapidly. And we need to provide incentives to do that, which ties me back a little bit into what you've been doing in Ireland, which I'm truly fascinated with. You know, you have a very visionary government, and I'm completely neutral. I'm not on the left or the right or any of this. I just see what I, you know, what, what I see here. And this government has taken it on to say we need to develop agriculture, number one, and, and, and agriculture production and food security as a high priority, which is a very important part. Many countries in the world haven't done that, and they will over time, because it will be the case for many. And we want to do this in the most sustainable way. And we cannot just talk about it. We need to measure it. And we, have, we heard this morning you're measuring footprints in 30,000, or was it 60,000 you mentioned? Close to 60,000. Close to 60,000 individual farms in this country understand their footprint. They know what they are doing. They know what happens in the value chain. They know what happens on the ground. They know what happens in the, in, in the stable with, with the cows and the cattle. They have a sense of what they are doing, and therefore they can improve. And they, they've been given stretch goals and stretch targets and saying, hey, you know, you know what you're doing. Now you can get better, and here is how to do it. You cannot do this in abstract. You have to have data and evidence and really understand what it is that's wrong and how it can be changed. And this is a government and a country, not only the government and the private sector, they're beginning to work together with Origin Green, which we'll discuss hopefully more this afternoon. But you make that connection. Because government can say all sorts of things, and the private sector will do something else, right? But we're now in a world in a decade where for the first time private companies are moving away from saying, this is not my problem. And if I do it, somebody else will make more profit. Therefore, you know, this is a this competitive disadvantage. I'm not going to go there because it costs money and doesn't benefit me. To a world 10 years ago where they said, we really have to be more responsible. It's not good. People don't like us. If you're not responsible, then they invented corporate social responsibility. There was a decade of corporate, like I call it, a decade of corporate social responsibility. You build a school in the village, and therefore you can use the palm oil from that region. And, you know, so... I'm not saying it's, it's bad, but it's, it's a step in a direction. But now in this decade, we're seeing big corporate and big private companies realizing that they essentially have no future as a company unless they can show and demonstrate that they're truly sustainable in the way they work. And that's a big word. It's a very big word, right? A very big word. And therefore, there's a lot of skepticism. You know, in the boardrooms, they are worried. And what will this do to our bottom line? Is this really necessary? There is a growing recognition that it's not a question of whether or not you as a company CEO will go there. It's not the question. The question is when will you go there? And when that is the conversation, very quickly there are those who say we're not going to be last because if we're last, we may be out of business. And then this whole dynamic is evolving. And you mentioned this this morning as well, right? Even within Ireland, there is a dynamic there are still those who are skeptical, but there are those who are early out, and they're going to do it, and they're going to change. Fascinating story internationally, not in Ireland, but it, I, I was in, together with a bunch of business executives, like 200 of them in Germany a few months back, and I asked them the question in the room. I said, how many of you know your company's footprint? These were mid-sized companies, German entrepreneurs, decent, you know, reasonably big-sized companies, not the biggest ones, but mid-sized companies. Many of the CEOs socially very responsibly inclined, they want to do good things. They don't want to be damaging to the environment. They want to be socially responsible. Say, so how many of you know your company's footprint? What was your guess out of the 250? How many raised their hand? Ten? Zero. Zero? Two. And, I, and only I could see the hands. They didn't, they didn't do this. They were like... <laughs> right? So because they weren't quite sure whether they really know it. And, and then I said, wouldn't you really want to know, right? And of course, yeah, everybody actually really would want to know. I mean, it, it, this is not just business, right? It, actually, you would want to know whether you are responsible or not. And these are people who, who are by their nature responsible people. They're not <laughs> mavericks or cowboys out there. So there was a big shock, right? And then so, yeah, we really should be doing this, right? And so there's this example. And, and do any of you know Puma Company? You know the shoe manufacturing Puma, right? Did you know the story of Puma and Jochen Seitz, who is the CEO? He, at some point after a conversation like this, went back to his team and said, I want to know the footprint of my company. I want to be responsible, sustainable. Tell me, what do I need to do? What is it, number one? And then what do I need to do? I'll change the light bulbs to, to you know, the renewable ones. I'll, I'll get the hybrid car fleet. Uh, I'll, I'll do insulation. I'll change the windows in the factory, etc. And then hopefully we'll be in good shape. 
You know what the result of the analysis was? That his factory, his business, you know what percent of the total footprint of Puma Corporation that was? Guess, it's an interesting question. So Puma produces shoes, as you know, right? Put, manufactures them and sells them internationally. Sources internationally and sells them internationally. One percent hmm? was the company. You're close, it was 6%. 94% of the footprint of that company had nothing to do with Puma headquarters or the car fleet or the energy bill of, of the production facility or anything like that. 94% was a combination of the leather that they sourced for the shoes that came from the Brazilian, from cattle that were grown in Brazil after cutting down the rainforest. Uh, cotton that was produced in parts by child labor in some countries. The rubber that came from rubber plantations in countries, and I, you know, I mean, I don't have to go, to go there, right? So the whole sustainability and footprint question came to the surface and was utterly shocking. I heard this from him directly, right? He, he made a presentation at World Economic Forum a couple of years ago on this, and it was just transformational. He said, it changed me as a person, as a CEO. I had no idea, he says. He didn't know. He wanted to do good, he didn't know. So he then began to do two sets of books. He said, I do my typical thing, I just buy the stuff and put it in on what much I paid, and then I'm gonna put a value on the, the real value and cost of, of my input. And then run two books. He did it only for a year, then he checked the first book out, and now he actually has a true cost accounting. Now he's a private company, he's not a publicly traded company, so he has different dynamics around him. But this is visionary, this is leadership, right? And his example has resonated with many, many others. Others are in a more difficult situation because they're publicly traded and the bottom line pressure is much harder and all these things. But it's permeating the conversations in the boardrooms and, and, and in conferences where private sector actors are. And it's, you can go right across whether it's Walmart, Unilever, Nestle, uh, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, all these are now in a very different conversation space, way beyond corporate social responsibility into what do we need to do not only to be good ourselves, but how do we drive sustainability change on the ground? You know, if Walmart, which has a massive uh, purchasing capacity, goes to Vietnam and says, we, want to, we will only buy the cocoa beans from you if you can demonstrate that they are produced sustainably in all its dimensions. Believe you me, that changes the cocoa sector in Vietnam. So we think we change the cocoa sector in Vietnam, right? And Irish aid and others who, who interact with the government. We do as well, but when they come and say, this is what we, what we need, it has a massive implication. So they're becoming partners in, in, a, in a conversation around what does it take to change the, you know, the, the way things are produced. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor, uh, take span across uh, some of the issues that are close to our heart, talk a little bit about climate smart agriculture, talk a little bit about these global trends. Um, to maybe just a, a couple more points on, on the climate angle. We are 20, we, we had a conversation this morning, I don't know if it's 20% right now, 25%, 28%. The IPCC report said agriculture plus associated land use is 28%, maybe a little less, but it's huge. If we don't do what we've just discussed, and that means it begin to innovate and change the game and the way we operate, do you have any idea how much our percentage footprint will be by 2050? Because we, remember, the others are innovating. The others are doing things. Industry is getting more efficient. Transport is getting more efficient. Cities are getting into programs to do that. You know, transport, energy, all, all these are, are ahead of the curve. If we do business as usual, that means close our, our eyes and just not worry about mitigation and any of these things because it's food and therefore it's okay, which is not an island. I, I totally get that. But in, in many parts of the world, there is still this, this happy belief. We will be 70% of all global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Is that tenable? No, we will be caught long before then. And then the question is how long will it take us to change the game? And you, are, you know agriculture space, it takes a long time to do change in agriculture. Whatever the research requires this, it will take a decade to get it to practical applications. There, many things cannot be quantum leaped or you know, jump to the next technology. It's not like in the telecom sector. You don't need the version 4. You go straight to the version 5 or the version 6. You don't necessarily do that in agriculture that easily. So that's why I feel tremendous urgency to put serious amounts of money into agricultural research. We need to double the research budget globally because we need a new type of agriculture. And we need, and that brings me to my, my final point, we need champions 
to drive forward what I've just tried to describe to you. Because the world needs leadership. The world is void of leadership when it comes to international issues. There is tremendous leadership locally in many places, but it's very, very thin at the global level when it comes to champion profound change, champion profound change in the areas that are important to all of us, whether it's in oceans. You may, some of you may have been involved in the, in the global oceans debate, one of the biggest tragedies on this planet. What's been happening there? We all know what's wrong, and it's incredibly difficult to get change. Climate change is a very good example. You know, 19 years of UNFCCC negotiations haven't has gotten very far. Hopefully, that will change in a year or two from now. But in agriculture, it's completely absent. Do you know that nobody in the UNFCCC ever talks about agriculture? It's just not even been negotiated. Because it's politically sensitive. Oh, really? Gee, yeah. I think we need to do better than that, right? <clears throat> and that's why we need leadership and champions. And, and one reason I, I followed Tom's invitation, because here, here is a man who is a leader. He's changed the game. He's changed the needle single-handedly together with a number of others on the, on the nutrition agenda globally. Your country, represented through him and, and Mary Robinson and a number of individuals, have changed the discourse globally and have led to action that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. And it, it, it's that type of leadership that we need in agriculture going forward. And that we had a conversation, I don't want to go too deep into it and don't talk too long, but we had a conversation around the role of the European Union and, and Europe broadly, of which you are a part. Um, Europe has a tremendous opportunity. It's had, it has 50 billion euros that it gives to agriculture and farmers in Europe. No smiles here. Everybody knows the common agricultural policy and its history and its controversy and everything else. And for many, many years, and in, even until today, there's a lot of money going there. And it's come, it's, gone, it's come a long way. It's gone from a simple production support to a much more enlightened, much more differentiated tool that gets you broad environmental outcomes. Is this the end of it? I'm, where I said no. I hope it's the beginning. And we were saying right now it's in the order of 20% maybe that goes into mitigation or into a new type. I don't know. What, what's the percentage right now? Well, it depends on how you, you count it. Roughly 20%, one-fifth, goes into the kind of climate-smart agriculture that I was describing that supports a good agricultural practice, that builds resilience, but that also really makes a difference in the, in the overall footprint. Uh, my view should be a lot higher. And it shouldn't be called a subsidy. It should be called an investment. We need to invest in agriculture in Europe to develop the hybrid car, the solar panel, the windmill, the electric car in agriculture because we have the firepower. We have the money sitting in Brussels. and in, in, This is a rich environment. 50 billion euros can change the game if it's used for agriculture and, and the right type of agriculture. So for once, the World Bank's not saying, don't do it, it's inefficient, get rid of it, which is what we've done for a long time. <laughs> Uh, in many of these subsidy schemes, now I'm talking a different language because I now feel that we really need to invest in agriculture for the reasons that I've tried to argue and that I've tried to lay out in front of you. But we, do it, we need to do it in a very targeted and, and very deliberate way, and that will then provide the leadership for the rest of the world that can be followed. You can develop the models, the packages, the operational approaches to this, the policy and the whole thing that can then transform the way others work. And I think others are looking towards that. So that's why my plea for leadership. I'm really delighted that this is a country where are up to the top level. Your, your prime minister is committed to a change in agriculture and, and is, is, is behind it. And the, the ministry is doing an amazing job in not only moving the needle domestically and in Europe and then hopefully now internationally. So I see Ireland as a phenomenal partner, both government and private. And we'll come back to the origin green as well, because there is leadership as well. We want to work to closely together to help translate that concept to other parts of the world as well. So thank you for your attention.